get okay. Let's get started. Okay, I'm going to give a little treat. It's going to be mostly for people online. That's going to be a blessing because I notice they get a lot messed up with different end times event. A lot of them were asking me about that. So what I'll be doing is that I'll, uh, this whole teaching hour, I'm going to give you a chart on the sequence of the end time events. So it's going to be basic. It's going to be basic and simple. So all of you should be able to understand, and hopefully it'll be a blessing. Amen. Let's start with Luke chapter 21, please. Luke 21. And we will also look at 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. <clears throat> and we'll also look at Luke chapter 21. So this will be just a simple Bible study on end times events. So there are many people who get messed up in doctrine. One group thinks that they will go through the tribulation and after that, they will be raptured after that. Other people believe that the tribulation is <coughs> already starting right now, and that there is no rapture. And that uh, they also believe, there's another group that believes, that we will bring our own kingdom on earth. That we're fighting right now against the tribulation antichrist system right now, and we're the ones responsible for bringing in God's perfect kingdom on earth. Other people believe there's going to be a rapture before the tribulation, and then after the tribulation, then God will have to bring his perfect kingdom himself down on earth. Then there are other groups of people who believe there's going to be a rapture before the tribulation. We're going to go through the tribulation. And then there's another rapture sometime at the end of the tribulation. And then we're going to have God's perfect kingdom on earth. There are people who believe that uh, when we die, then God's going to have a resurrection and then in this resurrection, we're going to immediately go to God's judgment. Then there are other people who believe that there's a judgment in the middle of the tribulation, a judgment uh, before the millennium, and another judgment after the millennium. So th there's a lot of different teachings on this. So we want to know the sequence, how it works, right, about end times. So let's start off with the first thing. We're going to start off with the rapture. So the rapture is before the tribulation. Whether you believe it or not, it doesn't matter what you believe, Amen. it's what Amen. the Bible says. So the Bible says that sometime we will be raptured after the tribul uh, excuse me, before the tribulation. There will be a rapture after the tribulation as well, but we will discuss that later. So we will experience a rapture sometime before the tribulation. So let's put today's age right here. We are today right here. And another thing about today is that the church, we're the church, right? So obviously the church is here today. So notice that in your Bible, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and chapter 5, Paul is speaking to the church. So today, the church. We're at this timeline. What did he say to today, the church? Let's start off with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and then we'll look at verse 9. <clears throat> For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice verse 9, God hath not appointed, so meaning a timeline. In a timeline, God did not put us to wrath. In a timeline, He put us to obtain salvation. But what is this salvation? You'll notice it's the rapture, verse 10, who died for us that whether we notice, wake or sleep, whether we're alive or dead, we should what? Live together with him, be up in heaven with Jesus. This is really clear at 1 Thessalonians 4. Look at chapter 4. Chapter 4, and we will read verse 15. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Okay, that's the same context as 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, right? Remember in 5, 9, it says wake or sleep. So this is the same context here. You'll notice whether we're alive or whether we're asleep. So it's the same idea, whether you're alive or you're dead. That's the idea. Keep reading. What happens to those who are alive and those who are dead? Notice right here, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Notice the dead are resurrected. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So notice we get caught up together with those who died. And we get caught together with them, notice, to meet the Lord in the air. So notice you go up in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So notice right there, you get raptured up to heaven. People argue there is no such word as rapture in the Bible. True. But guess what? There's no such word as Bible in the Bible either. That doesn't mean there's no Bible. Just because rapture is not in there, that doesn't mean there is no rapture. The word rapture, it comes from a Latin. Where we get our English word rapture is actually from Latin. The phrase where it's referring to snatched or caught. Snatched up or caught up. That's why you get the idea about uh, raptor raptors, where they talk about some dinosaurs like raptors, because they're what? Catching up. They're probably snatching up. So that's the phrase. Now, did the Bible say this? Yes, it did. In 1 Thessalonians 4. Caught what? We are caught up together with them. So guess what? Rapture is in the Bible. So the word rapture is in the Bible. So, this seems accurate, because Paul is speaking to who? The church, right? He's speaking to you today, right? He says, we, 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 we. So, meaning us today. So, sometime us, for us today, we're going to experience a rapture. So far, we get that. Now, here's the idea. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it says, the appointment is not for wrath. So, whether, so this time period that we're going to be in, when we get raptured, Remember, verse 9 and 10 says we're going to be raptured. We're not going to be appointed to wrath. So when we get this rapture, we're not going to go through a time period appointed. We're not going to go through a time period of wrath. That's why we believe we're going to be before the tribulation. Why? Because the tribulation is known to be wrath. Now, they will deny this. They will deny, some people will teach, the wrath is occurring sometime in the middle or after the tribulation. It's not the whole tribulation time period. That's what they will argue. But look at Luke chapter 21, please. Luke chapter 21. I'm going to look at Luke chapter 21. And then go to Matthew 24 as well. Matthew 24 is one of the most important passages about tribulation. So you want to bookmark that one, because we're going to look at that quite often. So we've seen our rapture verses. It's going to be 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Thessalonians 5. The tribulation, we're going to base it off of Matthew 24 and Luke 21. And then we'll go to another verse later on. Let's look at the book of Luke chapter 21. And then also Matthew chapter 24. Now we're going to start with Matthew 24 so that we can start with the context and the idea, shall we? So let's start off that way. Matthew chapter 24. Let's start off with verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the what? End of the world. So the disciples are asking Jesus what's going to happen at the end. And Jesus is going to explain what's going to happen at the end times, the apocalyptic events, the tribulation event. So, verse 4, Jesus answered and said, boom. From verse 4, you'll notice Jesus goes nonstop talking, answering that question of what happens in the tribulation. That's why Matthew 24 is going to be an important passage to tell you what's going to happen at the tribulation. Now, do we know that this is a tribulation? Yes, it's going to be pretty obvious because look at verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So you notice that? Tribulation, it says. You'll notice verse 29, immediately after the tribulation. So there's no doubt Matthew 24 is talking about the tribulation. Now, what's going to happen at the tribulation? You'll notice a couple things going on. First of all, we're going to look at verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So notice that the Jews right here, they're running away. 
So Jews will be concentrated right here. And notice that they're running away for their lives. There's something going on here. Let's keep reading right here. You'll notice verse 19, And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. So the, notice the Bible says right here that, man, if you're pregnant during this day, woe unto you. It's not going to be a good time to be pregnant. So this is a day of horrible, this will be a day of horrible days. You notice right here, verse 20, But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So you notice the Sabbath. Why? Because he's speaking to Jews right here. So there's no doubt the tribulation event will be focused on Jews during this time. And the Jews are running away from something here. Let's also keep reading right here. You'll notice verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show si great signs and wonder wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So you'll notice right here that during this timeline of the tribulation, that there's going to be some kind of false Christ or anti-Christ. That's where you hear the idea about the Antichrist who will rule the world. Because you're going to get that. So not only is there a false Christ, Antichrist, you also have the false prophet. It's going to show you great signs and wonders. You notice that verse is scary. It says the deception is so great that if it were, if, if it were possible, they could deceive the very elect. So you notice right here this deception has to be really great. So Satan's not going to fool you coming out with a pitchfork and a pentagram on his forehead and say, I'm the, I'm the Antichrist, stay away from me. He's not going to do that. What he's going to do is that he's going to come down very deceptive like Jesus Christ, like a genuine prophet, and he will come to you teaching the things of God and Christianity that will be so deceptive you would think that this was the real Jesus Christ. So we see these things happening. Now let's keep reading right here. Notice verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the power of the heavens shall be shaken. So notice right here that these days, okay, notice immediately after the tribulation of those days, right? So these, remember this, these are called days. And it says, of tribulation, yes? Yes, so these days are referring to the tribulation. But we wonder if it's referring to wrath as well. You'll notice the sun gets darkened, moon turning to blood. There's chaos in the heavens, right? So we also see chaos in the heavens. So we notice that in the verse, correct? We saw that in the Bible? Okay, so we notice that. We'll notice right here, the sun darkened, moon shall not give her light, stars shall fall from heaven. And notice verse 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Notice this is, verse 29 said, after the days of the tribulation. After the days of the tribulation, what are you going to have? You're going to have the coming of the Son of Man from heaven. So you'll notice right here, that's why we call this the second advent. So you'll notice right here the coming of Christ, also known as the second advent. He's coming down. So is that correct so far, the timeline? Yes, we got tribulation, second advent, no question. There's no question, today the church is going to experience a rapture. Now the issue is this, the issue is should there be a dividing line right here? Is it, does it make sense that the rapture has to be before the tribulation? The church is before the tribulation. Remember, 1 Thessalonians 5 says we're not in the time period of wrath. Today, we're going to experience some kind of rapture. Not only that, we saw in this verse, this is called days of tribulation, but is it wrath? Now look at Luke chapter 21. Luke 21. Notice Luke 21. Now keep your hand at Matthew 24 though. All right, This will be our bookmark. So keep your hand at Matthew 24. So go to Luke 21. 
Now look at this. It's repeating Matthew 24. It's repeating Matthew 24. Verse 21. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Remember that? That's, that's the same thing as Matthew 24, right? The Jews running away. Let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. So it's repeating the same thing. So this is a tribulation. There's no doubt. Let's keep reading. And let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. Look at verse 23. But woe unto them that are with, that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. So it's saying, woe unto you if you have a child pregnant that day. It's repeating Matthew 24, yes? Okay, so there's no doubt Matthew 24 is the same thing as Luke 21. There's no doubt about that. Now, remember, Matthew 24 called it days of tribulation, right? Look how Luke 21 called it. Verse 22, for these be the days of what? Vengeance. Vengeance. Look at that. That's why tribulation is wrath. Now, some post-tribulation proponents, uh, they will try to argue, well, it said vengeance, not wrath. But look, vengeance is the same thing as wrath, so that's not a really good answer. But let's keep reading right here. Verse 23, but woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Days, right? What are these days? For there shall be great distress in the land, and what? Wrath, wrath upon this people. Okay, so there's no doubt it's accurate to call tribulation wrath. There's no doubt about that. These are the days of wrath, Luke 21. Matthew 24 calls it days of tribulation. Thus, tribulation is wrath, whether you like it or not. Amen. But this also makes more sense because look at Revelation 16. Look at Revelation 16. And look at Revelation 6. Look at Revelation 16 and Revelation chapter 6. Some people, they're going to try to argue that when God pours out His wrath, it's going to occur sometime in the middle or sometime near the end of the tribulation. But let's be honest, I think it would make more sense to say that the whole time period collectively has wrath occurring. That would make more sense. Why? Because there are so many bad things going on that you don't want to be there. I mean, the verse says, woe unto you if you have a child during that day. So you'll notice it makes more sense to, rather than saying the wrath occurs at the middle or sometime at the end, why not just say, yes, it occurs at the end, yes, it occurs at the middle, because collectively as a whole, there's all kinds of wrath happening. So let's look at Revelation chapter 16. There's no doubt there's more than one wrath, more than one wrath. Because look at Revelation 16 verse 1. Now, this is Revelation 16. So remember, this is well underway during the tribulation now. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of what? The wrath of God upon the earth. Notice how many different vials of wrath. Verse 2, there's a first wrath. Verse 3, a second wrath. Verse 4, third wrath. If you go all the way to the end of the chapter, there are seven different vials of wrath. Why? Because there are so many different events of wrath occurring. Now, here's another thing right here. Go to Revelation 6. Revelation chapter 6. And I, verse 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. Now, before chapter 6, Revelation chapter 1 through 4, chapter 1 through 4, the tribulation did not occur yet. All right? You're going to see from chapter 1 through 5, it's not describing the tribulation hell on earth yet. Chapter 6, verse 1, he's opening the seal. So note, remember, a seal is enclosed. So this seal has been closed all this time, and now it's opening. And when it's opening, notice that all of these events of the tribulation start. So let's look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. <clears throat> Verse 2, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Notice that when this first seal was open, the first seal that was open, a person came out in a white horse, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Verse 3, And when he opened the second seal, now here comes the second seal. Notice in the second seal it says, verse 4, 
Now, does this not look like God's judgment? Does this look like a time of peace or God's judgment? Verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So notice these nations turning against each other. There's war. So this is not a time period you want to be in, see. But notice that there's great judgment and wrath. Verse 5. Notice there's famine in verse 5, verse 5, at the third seal. And then you'll notice at verse 7, the fourth seal. Verse 7 and 8, that don't look like wrath to you. Death came out and hell followed with him. Power was given unto him to uh, go over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword. That ain't wrath to you. This, notice right here that Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 all the way down to verse 8, you got this, ever since the first seal was open, God's wrath was starting. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice right here, this wrath is not something occurring at the middle or at the end of the tribulation. It's ever since the first seal. You'll notice that wrath is all over. So it makes more sense to call the tribulation event collectively as wrath. But within this days of wrath, you see many different wraths occurring. Now look at this, you got all these events of wrath occurring, and then you got a final event of wrath. This second advent right here, you'll notice, is the great day of wrath. But wait a minute, I thought that Luke chapter 21, remember Luke 21, it called it what? Days of wrath. But then here's right here, we call it the great day of wrath. Why? Because, it's like what I told you over and over again, it makes sense to collectively call this whole event wrath, and you got many different wraths occurring. Remember Revelation 16? You got the vials of wrath. And remember, it's vials, so meaning more than one. So that should be evidence enough. So, there are so many different wraths occurring right here. That makes more sense. So collectively, why not just be honest and call it wrath? Days of wrath. That would be honest enough. And Christians are what? Not appointed to wrath. Thus, see, that's why we have a rapture before the tribulation. That makes sense. Now, God calls this great day of wrath. How do we know it? Okay, we got the first seal opening up, which, uh, and then the second seal, the third seal, the fourth seal... Look at the last seal, all right? Look at the last seal. Look at verse 12, verse 12. Well, actually, not quite the last, but we're almost there. Verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Wait a minute. Remember Matthew 24? The sun becomes darkened, moon turned to blood, stars fall, there's chaos in the heavens, Matthew 24. Something's occurring right here. Remember Matthew 24 said, when the sun gets darkened, moon turns to blood, what happens? Christ comes down, right? Look at, that's what's going on, because keep reading, Christ is coming down. Look at verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Notice right here, verse 16, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from what? The wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Notice verse 14, The heavens depart as a scroll. Why? Because Jesus is coming out of heaven. You'll notice at verse 16 and 17, the people on earth are scared to see Jesus. They don't want to see Jesus. So that's why they're crying for the rocks to fall on them. And they call this the great day of wrath. Now let's keep reading right here. So then we know that this one is occurring sometime after the tribulation. And we know that the Christians will be raptured long before these events of wrath unfold. We see multiple different wraths occurring. And then you got the final one, which is the great day of wrath, which is occurring finally at the end. Now, what's interesting? Look at Revelation 6, verse 1. Remember, that's the first seal. Remember, first seal opened. 
tribulation start. Tribulation start. Guess what? In Revelation chapter, you see the word church mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Revelation 6 is the start of the tribulation. Guess what? Ever since you start off with Revelation 6 all the way to the end, remember Paul was speaking to the church, right? We're going to get raptured. But ever since you start Revelation 6, the beginning of the tribulation, the word church is not mentioned one time ever since the beginning of Revelation 6. Why? See? There's something happening right here. But it's also interesting. Keep your hand at Revelation 6 and 5. It's not church that's mentioned, but what is mentioned? Look at Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed in 144,000 of all the tribes of who? The children of Israel. Look at that. Ah, remember. Matthew 24. They which be in where? Judea. Judea. Jews. Remember that? Jews. Remember Revelation 7? Jew. So church is not mentioned, but Jews are mentioned. Ah, you know why? Because this is a time period for the Jews, not for the church. That's why God did not appoint the church for this time period because this is not our appointment. Our appointment's right here. But the Jews, this is their appointment. Remember, remember God hath not appointed to wrath. But the Jews, this is their appointment. You know why? Because God did set up a clock, an appointment with them. Go to Daniel. Go to Daniel 9. Now keep your hand at Revelation 6, though. We have to go back there. God set up an appointment. He set up a time clock with them. Look at Daniel chapter 9. Now you notice right here that it's that's why these people who claim to be eschatology scholars and people who believe the post-tribulation rapture and all kind of stuff, they think that revelation can be smoothed out in chronological order, one, two, three, and you can find the event. No, that's not how it works. You've got to do scripture with scripture, and then that way you can see which time period it's going to be in. Remember, when God gives... Do you think God gives everything in neat chronological order when he gives prophecy? Look at the book of Isaiah. When he gives prophecy, does he prophesy about the coming of the Messiah when he comes the first time? At a chronological order when he comes the second time when he rules over the world? Or is it all different? It's all different. If you're familiar with your Bible reading about the prophecies of the Messiah, it mixes up the first coming with the second coming all over. So that's how prophecy is. Prophecy works like that. But how you arrange it in order is with scripture, with scripture, and then you can see which timeline it fits in. Now look at Daniel chapter 9, and we will read verse 27. The Bible says right here in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Okay, where does this week come from? So there's this one week, whatever that week is, in Daniel. So in Daniel 9, 27, there's a one week. What's this one week here? Let's go backwards, all right? Let's go backwards, that way we can understand in order. We're going to look at verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, seven plus and three score and two weeks, seven plus sixty-two. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Okay, Daniel 9, 25, the Bible gives a calculation of 69 weeks. This 69 weeks is what? Verse 25 says, 69 weeks is going to refer to the coming of Messiah, the Prince. Now, did the Messiah come? Yes, he came a long time ago. The Messiah came and Jesus already died on the cross a long time ago. So this 69 weeks, we already know, is past. Now, let's keep going backwards. That way we can find out what this one week is. All right, let's keep going backwards. Now, go to verse 24 now, verse 24. The Bible shows right here in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Uh, let me flip a page right here. Okay. 
Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and what? Prophecy. Notice to seal up the vision and prophecy. Notice verse 24, it says, upon thy people. Now what's important? Remember, Revelation has the first seal unlocked here because God had a sealed appointment. Notice that he, and this time period, you have Jews paying attention to, right? Daniel 9, 24 told you it's going to be upon thy people, Daniel, the Jews. And he says this time period is what? 70 weeks. Oh, now we get it. Okay, now we know what this one week is. 69, remember I said already passed, right? Now we know what this one week is. This is, that's why they call this Daniel's 70th week, you'll hear. So this is called Daniel's 70th week. Why? What is this one week? Now, you can already guess because you're connecting all the puzzle pieces together. That's how scripture works, see? You can probably guess what this is. This has to be the tribulation event. But let's compare Scripture with Scripture again. Now, your hand is at Matthew 24, yes? Or it's bookmarked, and then you got another one at Revelation 6, right? See, we're, see Scripture with Scripture. Amen. That's why, look, the, do you think the Bible's kidding? Study, study, study to Amen. show thyself approved unto God. A workman, workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Does that make more sense now? See, that's why we believe in dispensationalism, rightly dividing the word, studying so that you can, all the things can connect and come into light. All right? Now, let's look at, this one definitely is a tribulation, because let's read right here. Daniel 9, 27. So let's read it right here. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. So notice right here, there's an abomination of desolation during this one week. Go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Now keep your hand at Daniel 9, though. I apologize. Keep your hand at Daniel 9, though. All three places, remember. Keep your hand at all three places. Do you remember? Now, don't, for, don't forget. Study, study, study. So remember now. What was Matthew 24? The tribulation, right? Right. We already saw that. The whole chapter is about the tribulation. Look what the Bible says in Matthew 24 about the tribulation. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. When he therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, oh, boom, boom, boom. You see that? It's scripture with scripture makes everything come to light. Daniel 9.27 says it's going to, re during this one week, abomination of desolation occurs. And Jesus told you at Matthew 24, the abomination of desolation occurs in the tribulation as spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Boom. So this tribulation time period we know is the abomination of desolation. So, look at this now, all right? Scripture with Scripture now. That's why you will be a post-tribber and an amillennialist when you're lazy with Scripture. Amen. Notice when you study the Scriptures, you'll notice right here, Scripture with Scripture. This one week, what is this one week? We know it's a tribulation. How in the world did you get the idea? Because during this one week, the abomination of desolation occurs. Matthew 24 says, abomination of desolation occurs during the tribulation. There you go. So now we know that this one week here is the tribulation. Now go back to Daniel 9. This is why scripture with scripture makes so much things come into light. So come into light. Come into light. This is an amazing book. Look at Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. So notice right here we're going to look at verse... 24, 70 weeks are determined upon Daniel's people, Jews. But some of the people will argue this is not referring to Jews. You can't say tribulation time period is for Jews. No, you're wrong. 70 weeks 
God made a what? Appointment. 69 passed. He has an appointment for that one week. It's definitely Jews. It's not for Christians. If you insist tribulation, this appointment, this tribulation is appointed to Christians and it's not appointed to Jews, look how you look at verse 24. There is no way this appointment is for Christians. You think this appointment of the tribulation is for Christians? Look at verse 24. Upon thy people, so that's Jewish, and upon thy holy city, Jewish. See? It's not referring to Christians. We don't have a holy city on this earth unless you're a Roman Catholic. Then you do have a holy city on this earth that you can claim. But sorry, we Christians don't. We believe Amen. that the, our body is the holy temple, the temple of God. That's it. So that has to be Jewish then, the holy city, Jerusalem. But let's keep reading. To finish what? The transgression. And to make an end of what? Sins. Seventy weeks long it's taking for this group, this nation, to finish its sin. How many of you got saved in seventy weeks length of time? There is absolutely no way. All right? This salvation, you'll notice, of sins is not individual salvation. This has to be a national. It's referring to as a nation. Why? Because at the nation of Israel consistently rejected, rejected their Messiah, stoned the prophets, and they rejected Jesus Christ when the apostles came out. So as a nation, their sins are bound, and God has judged them ever since for the past 2,000 years of history, right? As a nation, the Jews have suffered immensely, because why? God has stored up for them. Their sins are brought to remembrance. Remember the Jews, what they said when they crucified their Messiah? His blood be upon us and upon our children. As a nation, their sins are kept. Keep reading right here. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Come on, man. Did, you, did it take you 70 weeks long to bring in everlasting righteousness? No, it's as a nation they get their righteousness as a nation, as a forgiveness of sins. So you got to realize this. As an individual today, no matter what nation you are, as an individual, you are forgiven, say, by the blood of Jesus Christ immediately on the spot, and you are that church. But as a nation of Israel, as your, if you are a Jew as a nation of Israel, your nation is bound by your sins, and then your nation has been suffering ever since because of the sins that your nation committed. So God's going to concentrate on your nation one day at the tribulation. As an individual, no matter what nation you are, you become the church saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Righteousness, forgiveness of sins immediately on the spot. If you are a Jew from a nation, your nation will get its salvation one day during the tribulation as a nation forgiveness of sins not the same salvation of Jesus dying on the cross washing away your sins on the spot that is proof that there's a difference of salvation here national salvation and an individual salvation if you don't believe there's a difference of salvation of an individual and national how in the world are you going to explain Daniel 9:24 then I mean this righteousness this forgiveness of sins goes 70 weeks long you know why? God is focusing the nation. He has an appointment one day that he's going to go through the Jewish people and then he's going to use them. That's why they're running away. Why? Because they're the good guys. Who's the guy in charge? This guy. So when that abomination of desolation occurs, all this chaos and hell on earth is going to happen. Now let's keep reading right here. So you notice how Scripture with Scripture comes into light everything. Go to Romans 11 now. Romans chapter 11. Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. Look at verse 25. Romans chapter 11 and verse 25. So there is absolutely no doubt that God has to use the nation of Israel once more. So Daniel 9.24 and Romans 11 is absolute proof that God has to fo focus back on the Jews again. So when people try to tell you that the Jews are a forsaken people, 
that we are the nation that replaced this nation of Israel. That is heresy. Because God swore by His promise a long time ago, he got, He's going to focus on that people again. Because He made an appointment. No matter what you say or what I do, you're not going to ruin God's schedule and appointment that He made already. Because He had He fulfilled 69. He's got to do the 70th now. Romans 11, verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. So obviously Israel, what? They are so blind. Try to reach a Jew to salvation today. Try to, I mean, they're one of the hardest people to reach. The nation of Israel is blinded. When? Until when? Until when? The fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so, notice what? All Israel shall be saved. Now, does it make sense that every single Jew will be saved? No. It makes more sense to say, that's why this is talking about a national salvation. All meaning as a nation. The nation of Israel getting saved. This makes more sense. In verse 26, it's talking about a national salvation, not an individual salvation like we do. So all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn un away ungodliness from Jacob. Uh, notice right here, there, there's going to be coming Zion the deliverer. Jesus Christ is going to be coming. Oh, when does Jesus Christ come? Right here. Here he comes. Right here. He's going to be com coming down right here. And when he comes down right here, Ah, now it makes sense. Look at verse, the very next verse, verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them. He made a covenant. Why? Remember Daniel 9? He made a covenant 70 weeks. When I shall what? Take away their sins. Boom, Daniel 9. See, look, look at this. See, dis you, there is no doubt you have to be dispensationalist, rightly dividing. If you deny that, you're denying a wealth of evidence right here. It's all connecting right here. Scripture with Scripture is proving to you something rock solid right here. Now let's look at now let's look at other passages. We're going to go back to Revelation six, right? So your hands right here. Ah, now it makes sense. Everything's coming into light now. So remember, church is not mentioned one time, but Jews are mentioned all over. Revelation 6 is the first seal, correct? Correct. Notice right when the first seal of the tribulation opens up, look at chapter 5, the, right behind it. Chapter 6, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1. Notice the beginning of the tribulation, first seal. What's right before the beginning of the tribulation is notice verse 10 through 11. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat, that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever. Uh, they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. So notice that verse 10 through 11, there's a group, they call them 24 elders, whoever these guys are. Notice 24 elders are up in heaven. before the first seal of the tribulation opens. Who are these 24 elders? Look at scripture with scripture and it'll show everything coming into light. Who are the 24 elders? You'll notice right here what the Word of God speaks. We'll look at chapter 4. We'll look at chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Uh, wait, I was quoting Revelation chapter 4 verses 10 through 11, right? I apologize for that. It should be chapter 5, verse 14. So let me scratch this one out. So it's going to be Revelation chapter 5. I quoted Revelation 4. I don't know why. Revelation chapter 5. And you'll notice at verse 14, The four beasts said, Amen, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. So Revelation chapter 5, verse 14, Four and twenty elders are up in heaven. Right? So it doesn't change that fact that they're up in heaven. But who are these four and twenty elders? Look at verse 9, uh, verse 8, by context, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders. 
So here are the four and twenty elders. Who are these four and twenty elders? Verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Why? Because the first seal of the tribulation will open. So this is before they open up the tribulation. These guys are up in heaven. Who are they? For thou wast slain, look at this, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Those are Christians, blood-washed Christians. We are known as kings and priests of God in the Pauline epistles in the New Testament. We are blood-washed by Jesus Christ. And you'll notice that it can't just be 24 in number because it says out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. So it's all kinds of different people. So you'll notice right here these are referring to Christians. So notice chapter 5, verse 14. Christians are up in heaven. And then the very next verse, the first seal of the tribulation starts. And ever since that time, church is never mentioned one time. Yet Jew is mentioned all over. That's why, what, Paul said to us at church, hey, we're going to be raptured one day, not appointed for wrath. And then you'll notice chapter 5, verse 14, we are up in heaven before the first seal opens up. So thus, you see how these are connecting the timelines together? So there is a rapture before the tribulation. There is a tribulation time period dealing with the nation of Israel and Jesus Christ coming down at the advent. Now, my goodness, I'm surprised how much time has passed. Yes, let's look at Matthew 25. So I'm going to have to wrap this up quickly. So I apologize. We're going to have to wrap this up quickly. I could spend more time talking about the events, but I don't have time to talk about the events. So you'll see right here that this is not some simple ABC in chronological order, all right? like all these post-trips and eschatology scholars would like, would like to do. You can't do that. You have to go with scripture, with scripture, with scripture, and scripture. And by the way, this is just basic, basic eschatology. Amen. I didn't show you the advanced stuff yet. The reason why I know this is basic is because I'm not even looking at my note. I'm look, telling you everything on my head. Yeah. So this is all basic. This is all basic. So if you join Stephen Anderson's crowd, if you join Paul Begley's crowd, if you go all with all these prophecy scholar crowds, you don't know Bible. Amen. That's how bad they are. Amen. you got to be a Bible believer, KJV dispensational Bible believer. When you are that, then guess what? All of this will just be common knowledge. Amen. It'll be common knowledge. So, as much as I want to tell you about the judgments, there's a judgment seat of Christ up here, marriage supper of the Lamb, and then you come down with Jesus Christ, but I'm going to skip those verses. There's going to be a judgment of nations right here. I'm going to skip that one. There's going to be a millennial reign now, okay? So, when Jesus Christ comes down right here, we're going to have 1,000 years of reigning with Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 25, and then we'll look at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And then we'll look at Matthew chapter 25. So some people think there's going to be a final judgment one day, a rapture and then a final judgment. No, rapture way over there. You're going to find out right here that there's going to be a 1,000 year reign and there's also going to be Jesus Christ judging. Look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, so notice right here that the coming, remember the coming of Christ? So this is when he comes down. When he comes down, what does he do? Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So he's going to sit upon a throne on earth, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. So notice right here, Jesus Christ, he's gathering all the nations now, I'm not going to read this. You can read it yourself. Go to 33 all the way through 46. There's a judgment. So he comes down, and when he comes down right here, he sits upon a throne, and on this throne, he gathers all the nations. Why? Because, remember, in the tribulation, all the nations are under the rule of who? The Antichrist. So here comes all these world nations coming down, getting justly what they deserved. And then these nations come out, and they are brought to God's judgment. 
We call this, that's why we call this judgment of nations. Judgment of nations. Why? Because he's trying to find out which person from the nation can enter to his kingdom on earth. Let's keep reading right here. So you'll notice verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father. Inherit, inherit the kingdom. What's the kingdom? Prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So this is an earthly kingdom. So he's going to pick out which ones can go inside the earthly kingdom and which ones cannot go to the earthly kingdom. The ones who go into the earthly kingdom, thus we call it the millennium kingdom. Look at Revelation 20. Revelation 20. Revelation chapter 20. Now notice chapter 19. You'll notice that chapter 19, verses 11 through 21, which we won't read, that's his wrath, right? Where Jesus Christ comes down and what? Ju coming of Christ, second heaven. He comes down, squashes them like grapes, judges the nations. And remember, when he does that, then he's going to set up a judgment to pick which one will go and which one will go into the earthly kingdom. Then you got the earthly kingdom that goes for 1,000 years. And this kingdom we call Millennial Kingdom. Revelation chapter 20. And you'll notice Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast. Neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ how long? A thousand, a thousand years. years. Now notice, after the thousand years, verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, so after this thousand years, what happens? You'll notice that Satan gets loose, and there's your Gog and Magog, alright? Verse 8, Gog and Magog happening. So when you hear all these people panicking about Gog and Magog happening any moment, well, I'm going to tell you one thing, we've got plenty of time. Yeah. <laughs> but look, after what happens with Gog and Magog, look at verse 11. Uh, the thousand year expired, right? So this is after 1,000 years, not before, after. After 1,000 years, then what? And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose faith the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, blah, 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 the dead were judged out of those things. So notice another judgment with the great white throne. This is what we call the great white throne judgment. So now another judgment. What is this judgment for? This judgment is after the millennial reign. You'll notice, as you keep reading the verses, he's taking up all the dead. So all the dead come out of hell, all the dead of all time of ages, and he judges them. And when he judges them, he finds which one is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life and casts them into the lake of fire. And then after that, you'll notice, so I'm like, I, I'm not sure if I went past the camera right here, but after this, I'll just put this right here. After this is what? New heaven and new earth. We're at Revelation 20, right? Now look at Revelation 21. What does it say in the first verses? New heaven, new earth. Thus we begin eternity. Some of the people that I talk to, they don't know much Bible, so they think that... One, some people that I talk to think that it's going to be... We're in the tribulation right now, and then what's going to happen is, then there's a one judgment, and then after that, an eternity. This rapture will occur at this judgment. Look, see, they missed a lot, didn't they? Mm -hmm. See, that's why false, that's why those heretics, amillennialists, postmillennialists, post-tribulation people, all these people, pre rat people, etc., all these people are heretics because they missed out so much information. See, they're teaching you truth, they give you a verse, that's true, but look, they missed out all the other verses. There's so much information here that they missed in between. And guess what? Even though this is a basic study, I didn't give you all the verses yet. So this should be sufficient enough to show you the timeline of eschatology, how it works. And this is just a basic even, too. This is just a basic. If any of you are further interested, what you could do is watch our dispensationalism videos. We have long parts that go 20 parts, nearly an hour long. 
or you can also look at our apocalypse videos. Just look in our playlist of dispensationalism and apocalypse, and then it'll give you a little bit more detail from this.